So does it start? Yep. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tyson Norris. Uh, this is the OpenWIS Tech Interchange call for September 4th, 2019. Um, thanks for joining. Um, just looking at uh, who all is here, I think it's um, several regulars and a couple of names that I don't recognize. Uh, there's a uh, Nikhil. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, yes. Hi, I'm Nikhil. I'm from India. And uh, I'm, I'm just an enthusiast of OpenWisk and I decided to join the Slack channel. Uh, I'll be joining Nimbella soon, uh, which is one of the companies in serverless. So I thought I would, it's a good thing to uh, join the meeting and get to know what's happening. So. Awesome. Welcome. Okay, thanks. And I see a uh, Patrick uh, Plusnik. Yes. So, hi. Uh, so I'm with, I work with Matt um, and I'm interested in potentially getting started uh, doing some stuff with OpenWhisk. And so I just thought uh, joining the meeting might be a good place to, uh, to start. Awesome. Welcome. And I think uh, everyone else, uh, it's like the, the regulars of uh, IBM folks and uh, Adobe folks. Um, so uh, let me try to share and we can go through the agenda. Um, so We'll go through some uh, PRs that have gone through in the last two weeks. Um, if there's any topics that people want to bring up, um, I didn't see any uh, mails um, in response to my request for agenda topics. So um, if anybody has anything on their mind that they want to talk about, let's bring it up. Um, otherwise, uh, I have a couple of topics. Um, one of them is a proposal for uh, activation workflows. Uh, and then another one is um, um, trying to get some ideas on, on how we can get a sandbox directory going in the main repo for um, some experiments that are related to the proposal. Uh, and then we can wrap up by finding a host for the next meeting. Um, so um, I looked through the PRs that went through in the last couple of weeks. Um, there's a few more than this, but I, I pulled out the interesting ones. I think um, there's a few more um, kind of uh, uh, more detailed ones that I'm not sure how many people will be you know, super interested in those, but these were the interesting ones I thought. Um, so one of them is a uh, change from Roderick about um, uh, declaring certain properties to the init time properties so that they get passed um, to the init method on the action container. Um, another one is uh, setting the transaction ID into the, tra into the action container. So in addition to the activation ID, um, you can now get the transaction ID. Um, I think, uh, Chetan, you're on the line. Um, do, do you know, is there a corresponding um, uh, change uh, headed for the OpenWhisk SDK to propagate the transaction ID into um, downstream OpenWhisk calls? Uh, yeah, that is a pending item, and so that's why the issue is still open. Uh, need to add that thing in the OpenWhisk JS client. Uh, just not for the time. Okay. Uh, so uh, for for other folks, um, what this would allow you to do is is have the same transaction ID if you are chaining activations together by using the OpenWhisk you know Node SDK, for example. Um, you can you can add the same transaction ID um, to those downstream activations. Uh, and then there's a few changes related. Well, does there need to be a change to composer as well once that's in to pick it up there? Mm. Well, if, you had a, if you had a composition that was part of a, one of these larger transactions, I think you probably have to propagate it through. Yeah, that, I assume, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think that makes sense. I okay. don't know, Chet, Chet do you? Mm. Yeah, I'm, also, I'm not sure if the, because the composition at the end is driven by the controller itself. 
and the controller would propagate the transaction ID uh, for all the calls. So I think we are getting it still out of the box, but yeah, would be good to try it out and then see. It. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so standalone mode, uh, there's a few changes related to that. Um, one of them to enable couch CV support. Uh, there was a fix to the API gateway and, um, I don't remember exactly what the dev mode flag does. Um, Chetan, can you, can you describe that briefly? <laughs> yeah. So that just to make uh, that our life easy, like uh, right now with all the new features added in the standalone, the startup time is reached to like 15 seconds and uh, just to ensure that the end user has some free flight checks and then we do a docker pull. Uh, so, so that dev mode flag removes those checks. So I can still do my day to day development and just have that flag and get back to a startup of like six, seven seconds. Ah, Small got it. Time. Yeah, understood. Okay. So this is like um, speeding up the, the, turnaround time of, of launching it um, if you if you know that you may be able to do that yeah okay. um, I think by now whatever I planned for the standalone is done so uh, uh, yeah as now we can go to the maybe the release process and then have it exposed to the end users um, if anybody has other feature in mind speak and we can try to add it but as of now whatever I had my in, in my mind uh, a standalone feature set that's that's covered awesome yeah yeah that's great we should definitely definitely start pushing for a release in september of the, of the core system to get it out um, all right um does anybody have any other prs that they want to cover that i that i missed anybody? yeah i would I, I brought a PR, so this is Gosman. Um, I, I, I pushed the PR for the user events discussion that we had earlier this year um, in the domain repo, and also one for the um, uh, Kubernetes deployment. Um, so if anyone has time to look at that or, or just give you a review, it would be great. Do you know the, um, can you remind me the PR number for the user events? Uh, I can check. Cosman, have you had a chance to look to see why it's failing in Travis on the kube repo? Why the Prometheus uh, pod is getting stuck in a crash loop? Yes, um, it's related to the storage for for um, the, the persistence layer. Um, yeah, I can uh, I can add a fix for that today. Okay, great. And the PR for the uh, user events is four five eight four. Great, thanks. Okay. Okay. All right, great. It's um it's kind of an internally focused. PRs, but I've been doing a bunch of work on the release repository that hopefully make it easier for people to make releases. Um, so we'll, we'll hopefully get some more people being release managers and get some feedback on that. I don't, I don't think users care, but hopefully it makes our process easier for people to understand and, and drive. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys for uh, shepherding the releases through. Um, so let's see, I didn't get any emails on requested topics. Um, does anybody have anything that they want to, they want to bring up or share? Now's your chance. Okay. Um, well, so I'm going to cut over to a, uh, different presentation if I can stop sharing. Bear with me a second. So uh, this is kind of a uh, 
preliminary um, presentation. I haven't gotten it wrapped up to the point that I hope to, but um, my, what I hope to do is uh, present the basic info today and uh, what I would plan for is at the next meeting in two weeks, um, I could have a, sh a brief demo of some some code demonstrating kind of what what I'm talking about uh, here. So um, this is about uh, OpenWiz activation processing. So um, if if you can separate the, out the um, the API gateway and the um, the controller aspect for a moment and just kind of focusing on the invocation workflow um, so the data plane um, and you know some some challenges that we've had um, at Adobe and um, you know trying to figure out what we can do to make things um, kind of a uh, you know, equipped to kind of move forward to some some future integrations. Um, so just some background. Um, right now, the way the system is set up, the controller handles uh, routing all OpenWISC APIs, um, front door gateway issues, so authentication, authorization, rate limiting, um, scheduling activations to invokers. Um, and there's a uh, kind of non-trivial set of accounting that's done uh, per activation um, and um, per invoker scaling. This is maybe a little bit of the same um, aspect of accounting, but it's basically um, distributing activations across invokers based on both some logic as well as um, some accounting that's that's done to um, kind of tabulate you know, how many things are running in theory um, at individual invokers. Um, and I say in theory because um, it's, it's not really accurate at all in practice. Um, it's, um, it, there's kind of a, a best effort there, but the, the, the scheduling is um, kind, of, kind of based on the best case scenario of everything taking little or no time and um, having no backlog at the invoker, things like that. Uh, invokers uh, handle scheduling activations to containers, um, starting and stopping containers, the container lifecycle, uh, and then um, determining when to stop sending to a specific container and scaling to an additional container. Um, so that gets in the area of uh, dealing with concurrent activations arriving in containers and and doing similar accounting as happens in controller, except on a per container basis instead of a per invoker. Um, so that's just a brief summary of how things operate today. Um, some high level problems um, that, that I kind of see bubbling out of this. So, so one of them is, is um, duplicated or conflicting features. And, and by this, I mean, um, the, the notion of scheduling is, is very complex right now because the controller has one aspect of scheduling to an evoker uh, and the evoker has another consideration for scheduling and these aren't really coordinated at all. Um, there's, there's a little bit of um, coordination by um, in some places respecting um, the per action configured timeout but in other places that's not respected. Like there's, there's um, some timeouts in the controller that are, are um, global that um, don't respect the per action timeout. So I think it's in the, um, in the case where um, activations may run for too long, um, there's, there's kind of a global setting for removing those from the controller. Um, <clears throat> but the, the bottom line here is that, that we're, we're kind of scheduling in two different places. Um, and, and what we see is, is kind of either, either we get a back, uh, backlog of data arriving at the invoker, um, where things start to buffer in a lot of cases, or, um, we get, 
um, underuse of the invoker because of this um, kind of complex scheduling lack of coordination that is, is the way the system is currently implemented. Um, so another high level problem is the coupling of management workflows to execution workflows. So, so this is basically right now the, the data plane and the control plane are, are mix, mixed together in the same controllers. Um, and so we really can't um, kind of change the data plane without um, um, messing with the same code with, with, a, uh, with the development workflow happens. And I think ideally we'd be able to separate these two so that we can um, optimize the execution workflow uh, independently of the control plane. And um, finally, uh, is kind of a, a, a leap in um, you know integration features, where right now there's not any support uh, for delegation to other systems. So um, being able to work with non-container technologies like Viet Isolates or Knative or even delegated to AWS Lambda is a little bit of a stretch right now where we can sort of use Container Factory to, to emulate this. Um, but I think, I think we need something different to, to go further and, and have it still um, kind of make sense where you know, each environment has kind of substantially different types of needs. All right. So Tyson, what do you mean by the second point? Is that the CRUD versus invocation? Yes. So those, those operation? Okay, so we, you can actually separate those by routes if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, we, actually, we actually, there are some production deployments that do that where you, you route um, differently. Maybe we should just codify that as the way things are meant to be done. Yeah, right. So, so to have to multiple um, com controller configurations deployed um, and have, you know, separate... Um, gateway configurations to to isolate those routes. Yeah. Just like I, I, I interpreted it differently in that uh, there's control messages that says that say schedule this, and then there's a data that goes along with that, which is the invocation payload. And today both of those flow in Kafka. Uh, and to me, control plane and data plane separation uh, is more about separating those two flows than the CRUD separation, which think is legitimate, you should separate your CRUD controller from your invoke path. But I don't think the CRUD controllers sep are flowing through Kafka right now, right? Or the, the like CRUD that, operation. That, that's what I'm saying. I, so Dave asked if by control plane, you mean CRUD operations on the controller? I thought you said yes. And yeah. uh, I was just clarifying that I think control plane, data plane conflation today is tied to Kafka because the invoke message and the input payload for the action are flowing over Kafka. And to me, that's what control plane data plane really means, not so much the CRUD controller versus info controller. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're talking about um, um, kind of uh, CRUD operations on the container versus the action. In, in other words, I think, is that, uh, what, no, maybe, maybe, like, maybe you can maybe you can restate what you mean by control plane data plane. So I, I mean, I, uh, so 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 I mean specifically, I'm I'm more aligned with um, what Dave is describing. So so the development of actions workflow um, being being mixed in with the request processing of the. Um, the action invocation workflow. Okay, so then I, I did confuse things because uh, so my interpretation of control plane data plane is different, but I'll withdraw my comment then. Okay, I mean I think yeah, there's there's some other aspects to that, so um, that that may come up again here <laughs> very shortly. Um, so here's just to kind of verbalize a few proposals that I'm talking about. So one of them is is separating the execution workflow from the development workflow. Um, you know, as Dave is describing, you know, it, technically we we can deploy separate controllers, um, and I guess one of the one of the options that we get from separating, you know, controllers is, um, you know, we still have the same code base in that case, and 
and really there may be some cases where um, it would be nice to kind of optimize the execution uh, workflow independent, which would get at the point of having s not the same code base, but even separate code bases. Um, so while it's true, we can we can separate the the routes um, currently. Being able to change the actual um, processing um, it would be beneficial in some cases, and I think you know maybe that gets closer to what Roderick's getting at as far as. Um, yeah, you know, managing how um, containers are are dealt with. Um, so, um, being able to evolve the controller in a way so that we can adopt, you know, additional execution technology, um, separating it out from away from the CRUD operations would would definitely facilitate that. So, so for example, um, you know being able to introduce a new execution workflow um, that actually causes some changes in the controller. Ideally, we don't want to change um, or, you know, um, you know, have any, have any, you know, requirements for changing the controller for the, you know, action development process. Um, another one is, is separating uh, gateway considerations from the execution workflow. So, by this, what I mean is that um, currently the controller uh, provides kind of the front door operations that a lot of API gateways are used to provide for other systems. So things like authentication, authorization, um, doing rate limiting. Um, now there's, there's some other accounting that happens for things like sequences and, and um, um, conductor actions, but um, I'm I'm intentionally kind of ignoring those for now. But um, basically, you know, if if we can move the the API gateway um, kind of management layer into the API gateway, I think you know there there could be some benefits for um, you know uh, allowing um, you know better customization at the API gateway for those things, but also um, slimming down the functionality in the execution workflow in the controller um, so that it's dedicated just to, um, you know, optimal execution workflow for activations. Um, one of the other kind of notions that we've discussed um, here is uh, the potential of using multiple clusters behind the same gateway. Um, and you know some of that may be eased if we take logic out of the controller and move it into the API gateway. Um, and like I mentioned, keeping keeping the execution workflow as simple as possible. Um, the other aspect that I'm kind of getting at is is enabling multiple execution workflows. So um, by this, what I mean is. Um, you know, right now, um, the, the workflow is very much tailored to um, uh, starting a container, uh, initializing the container with the action code, um, uh, handling the response, collecting the logs, um, propagating data back to the controller. Um, so for some other environments that I'm that I'm talking about so things that the kind of extreme cases are considering K native as well as V8 isolates uh, you know on on one end of the spectrum if if you talk about um, leveraging K native to execute actions um, you know w we get to a system where um, we're delegating a significant portion of the um, life cycle into that system um, and it's it's independent of a container life cycle in many ways um, and similar for v8 isolates where if if we're operating a, uh, a system that is able to schedule code deployment to um, a, a v8 process and handle you know, effectively um, multiple actions in the same process, we again kind of break out of the, the container paradigm. And 
we can kind of force it to fit in there. Um, and, I, and I think there's the possibility of, of integrating, you know, both of those things with um, existing OpenWest system. Um, but what I'm getting at is trying to make something that's a little bit more um, designed to be flexible for delegating different aspects of the life cycle to these other systems. Um, and then as an optional additional piece, um, there's some, um, you know, how to, how to handle um, uh, reusable state and sharing state across um, um, the OpenWISC components where right now um, there's a little bit of state sharing going on at the controllers um, using the um, um, ACA clustering. Um, otherwise, um, there's only logic for um, kind of optimizing the, uh, the reuse of resources. And um, one of the challenges that, that we've seen is that, um, you know, trying to operate on a, on a broader um, cluster integration, it becomes uh, difficult to rely on um, the, the existing state management. And so um, part of this is to also propose um, how we can better um, share state um, and have, have the execution workflow still be stateless, but um, have, a, have a, some notion of sharing state through a distributed store. Um, and the goal there would be to maximize um, on-demand resource usage and to coordinate uh, cleanup of, of shared resources. So um, here's kind of a visualization of, of what I'm talking about where um, there's, um, there's, you know, the, the front door is still there's an OpenWIS gateway and there's still a um, open waste management layer that, that could be the existing controller as it is today. Um, but that the, the execution workflow would go through this component that I'm calling the open waste router. I know we've had other kind of architectural discussions about having a, a router component in the past. Um, and this is kind of a, um, an extension to some of those ideas. Um, but the the key here would be that the router doesn't really provide any execution itself, um, but it provides the ability to plug in different types of executions. Um, and so the examples that I've kind of been talking about are are being able to route to Knative, being able to route to some system that processes using V8 isolates, uh, and then. For, partly for compatibility, people like the way that the invoker operates today is to be able to delegate to an open whisk invoker. Um, and I think, you know, that would be possible without any, you know, major changes to the invoker. Um, so um, those, that's kind of the, 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 the basic overview um i can get into a couple of details um does anybody have any questions so far so um the the basic components that i was talking about are open with router open with execution providers um so with that in mind, um, some some examples, and like I said, um, I will I will build upon um, kind of what I'm describing here, and um, would would plan to show a um, code example uh, in the next meeting. But um, just some some basic examples um, that I'm talking about. So execution providers I've kind of talked about as uh, Knative V8 isolates and OpenWhisk invokers. Um, and some example workflows. So um, router sends all pre-warm container kinds to Knative execution provider. So if you imagine that um, if we um, kind of make Knative 
um, as a kind of um, um, a, a execution provider that will handle um, things that run in containers and things specifically things that can run in Node.js pre-warm containers, um, then um, you can imagine where having a Knative service that is um, treated as a container, um, that's kind of how it would map into the existing logic that we use in the invoker. So, um, you know, for example, you know, when, when a router starts up, uh, we allocate, you know, five Knative um, services uh, that have containers started already. And when an action arrives that hasn't been seen before, um, we allocate one of those pre-warm Knative services to this action. And then we just start delegating everything for that action to that Knative service. Um, and that means that the, um, the scaling, the initialization, um, is kind of delegated inside of the Knative workflow at that point. Um, another example is the router sends all VA to isolate kind to VA to isolate scheduler API. So this is, this is making a leap and assuming that we have some, some API um, service that's, that's running um, within the cluster where um, you know, maybe it has an API, let's say that's similar to Knative or, or an invoker type of API. Um, and we specify the, the action that's being run and we just um, forward any requests to run that action to that API. Um, black box, um, there, you know, I, I, I kind of see um, Knative as having a, a, a sore spot for th um, things like um, black box images where um, it may take a significant additional time to run an arbitrary image inside of Knative. And so maybe people would want to run black box um, actions using the existing OpenWhisk Invoker API. Um, so um, that could be another option as an execution provider that um, the mapping to that one is based on you know, black box kinds. Um, and then occasionally we've talked about uh, being able to delegate to external systems um, like Azure or uh, AWS Lambda. And um, if, 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 there's, if there's certain kinds or certain states of the system where we want to delegate to those, um, you know, this, this would be accomplished as an execution provider. And um, I think, you know, maybe the, the point here is that, um, you know, execution provider kind of loosely maps to what we have today as a um, container factory, um, but the, the API is, is slightly different and, and takes um, a slightly different stance on um, what should be common across the execution providers. So um, that's the basic summary of what I have to show for today. Um, just uh, early early comments on this. Any any questions? So, so are you envisioning the router sending stuff through Kafka? I mean, that's the sort of minimal delta. Is rename the the uh, invocation controller to be router and teach it that certain kinds go to different channels or something, right? Different topics. Um, no, I was I'm not, not, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not saying that's a good design. I'm just saying yeah. it's, or are you doing that as a, uh, it's really just passing through, you know, a, a rare request comes in, it takes the request, it throws it to some, some other system. That system is responsible for queuing itself internally. Yes, yes that, that yeah. one. And so, so router uh, um, uh, Kafka does not exist in, in any of the prototyping that, that we've done. So um, yeah, the, the queuing, um, you know, so, so the router would only have the responsibility of, um, of decoding which execution provider to use um, and then forwarding the request onto that execution provider. So yes, any, okay. any queuing or, uh, you know, any initialization, um, you know, anything 
um, of related to the life cycle of whatever environment is executing that code is delegated to the execution provider. Okay. And who's, who has the responsibility for um, supporting like the effect of the activation APIs? So the execution provider runs something, you know, do we get that back into a WISC invocation database somewhere? Does it, you know, what's, what's the, yeah, this is, uh, this is something that I talked to Matt about a little while ago. And um, this is kind of another opportunity to, um, so you, you could think of uh, like the router as the place where um, things, the execution providers meet up to be consistent. And so, um, yes, so if, if the router is proxying a request to Knative and the response comes back through the router, that's where we can um, capture that response and say, create an activation record for it, store some metrics for it, generate user events for it. And, you know, the, the response from a V8 isolate processor would be handled the same way. The response from an open whiskey invoker would be handled the same way. So while we're delegating to these other systems, we have to come back and treat the responses in a consistent manner to keep the API um, kind of the, the unified open whisk API. Um, I think that's, that's another kind of underlying goal is to, to be able to leverage these systems, but not expose these systems to users. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that sounds great. I mean, that, that's a great goal, I think, right? Um, so, so far, uh, the prototyping we've done has been in Go, um, just to keep it simple, fast, um, and, um, you know, trying something different to see how far we can get. So, um, the other part of what I was going to talk about today is um, where, where can we go to put code like this to iterate on in the open? Um, we have, we have a private repo currently where we've been, um, poking at some of this and, um, really, um, in order to share this with the community, I think there's a couple of options. So one, and we've talked a little bit about this in the past, but I, I don't know if anybody has had any concrete examples to actually um, make use of it. Um, so the couple of options that, that I think are obvious are either creating a separate repo um, where, you know, it's the OpenWhisk experimental repo, um, or uh, we create a directory inside of the master repo and, um, just let it live in there so that it has more visibility. Um, there's at least a few folks on the call that might have opinions. So does, does anybody, anybody have opinion? Fewer repos. I created yeah. directly in me. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it, for me, it seems for this particular thing, doing it in the main repo makes sense. The trick is to set it up so that it, that, it's possible to build the main, re main repo without getting any, any of this stuff and vice versa. Right. Yeah. And, and figure out what, you know, and set up the, you know, if we're going to release the main repo, we probably don't want to release this stuff yet. Um, the downside of doing the main repo is you've got a Travis CI that's 45 minutes, right? So it's a little hard to iterate quickly on that. Um, but yeah. that's sort of unavoidable. Yeah. And you know, uh, that's, yeah. That's the cost of bus doing business in the main repo right now. Um, okay, Although so. We do, have, we do have Jenkins, right? So, especially if it's experimental, right? We don't want to block main things, but we can rely more on the Jenkins test for uh, verifying changes on experimental stuff. Yeah, so I guess that's, that's a question is like, can we have the Travis build exclude everything in this experimental directory? Um, is is that okay which which means that it would never block anything but it also means that there's no guarantees that experimental would ever build i don't know if you can set up github that says you know uh, it's it's 
this precondition being Travis or it's this condition being Jenkins. So we might have to rely on committers being a bit more cognizant of which checks must pass for a particular PR. Um, but yeah, I think we, we'll have to figure that out. My preference would be not to do it in a separate repo. Okay. Um, let me play around with, uh, you know, I need to do a little bit to, to with the, the existing prototype code and the shape and um, do some, um, I'll, I'll get a PR together and, and, you know, we can talk about it there to see if we agree on, you know, how how the configuration for Travis should change with with this directory in mind. It's cool. I mean, Tyson. Overall, I like I like the overall direction. I think it's we need to start doing stuff like this. So. Uh, let's let's make it work in the community. Great. And I'll, I have a design document of I'm working on um, um, getting some more detail together beyond you know what's in this presentation. Um, so I'll shoot that to the dev list um, in the next day or so, and um, get a PR together, and um, and also plan for a um, a, a broader kind of walkthrough of um, code example you know, in, in a couple of weeks. One, one thing I'd, I'd like to bring up is if we are creating the experimental repo in main, um, there's, as you mentioned, there are other architecture proposals. Um, the one from uh, Dominic Kim, for example, comes to mind. And they had opened some PRs, but that just to, as point of integration, but I haven't seen actual code, but maybe then they can also rely on the same mechanism for contributing their code if they're still interested in doing that. Yeah, and I think um, I think there's kind of a question uh, for for developers that are making you know kind of significant changes. So, so the the question is, um, do you make your change uh, behind a feature flag inside of kind of the existing open WISC system, or um, do you try to leverage something that's new kind of based on this type of design? Um, and, you know, there's probably a lot of, of um, aspects that go into answering that for each individual, you know, community member. But, um, yeah. Um, I'll, right. I'll be interested to get feedback from Dominic on, you know, on this approach and whether it um, makes sense for for you know, his changes to leverage this or if it creates problems. Right. I mean, at the at the logo level you got here, it seems like his changes would be inside that open whisk bubble at the bottom right. And this is sort of a, adding a layer on top that lets you select other things. But there could be multiple open whisk logos, too, I suppose, with different schedulers. Yep. Um, sitting behind the router. Yep. Okay, great. Um, I guess if there's no other questions, uh, we can go to the last topic, which is the host for next meeting. September 18th. The volunteers. Not everybody at once. Well, um, Matt, I'm sorry, what's the, what's Matt, the date, Tyson? Uh, uh, September, September 18th. Matt will volunteer. All right. That's awesome. Thank you, Matt. All right, great. Um, I think uh, that's all I have. Does anybody have any other items they want to bring up?
All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining and uh, we'll resume in two weeks then and on the dev list.